I've spoken to a number of musicians, piano players often, um, who have quite a lot of classical training, but have struggled to make the jump from playing classical music to playing contemporary worship music with their church music team. This video is for those musicians. My own experience was that my classical music lessons actually gave me knowledge that I was able to apply to my improvised and more contemporary church playing. And so I'm gonna share a few tips here um, on how to reinvent the knowledge you already have as a classical musician to free you up for playing in the church context. Now, the first obstacle for most classical musicians is the chord sheets we use in church. If you're used to looking at dots on a stave, the idea of a chord sheet can be quite bewildering. Uh, there's no key signature and no time signature. There are usually no expression marks or bar lines or repeat markers. So the first thing is to learn how to understand chord sheets. And we have a separate video for that. Things like tempo, key signature, and the time signature are usually just discussed amongst the band but you could always write those things on the top of your chord sheet if it'll help you remember. The second biggest difference between classical and contemporary church music, at least certainly in a church like ours, is the need to be able to improvise around the given chords on the sheet. Many classically trained musicians find this thought overwhelming, but there is a wealth of knowledge you already possess, which means you are more than able to make the leap with a little help. Most improvising consists of using scales, broken chords, arpeggios, and basic triads. If you have progressed any amount in your classical education, you probably know about some or all of these. So let's look at how we can apply these techniques to play in worship. First of all, what not to play? Don't play the tune. <laughs> Often a classical musician wanting to join the worship team is tempted to do what I just did there and play the tune. However, like in an orchestra or wind band, the song's melody is reserved for a particular voice. And in this case, it's the voice of the vocalists and congregation. The other musicians do not play the tune. Rather, they use chords to provide harmony for the singers. A musician may use broken chords, scales, arpeggios to provide counterpoint. This helps fill out the music, adding texture and variety. If everyone just played the melody, it would sound very dull. So if I was to play Amazing Grace again, like I would for church, you won't hear the tune, but you will hear harmony that supports the tune. And so if you play the piano or have played an instrument, an orchestra or an ensemble, if you've ever sung in a choir, you'll get used to the idea of harmony. And uh, to create a harmony, it's just two or more different notes sung or played at the same time, making a chord. And that's all I'm doing there. I'm just playing chords to create a counterpoint or a harmony for the melody. The most common chord is the tonic triad, consisting of three notes, the first, the third, and the fifth of the scale. We can also play with counterpoint. With counterpoint, we can play a line that runs parallel to, but is different from the melody. Counterpoint could take many different forms. For example, variation, canon, or fugue. A variation would take the same notes as the melody, but where the melody goes up, the counterpoint variation might go down. A canon plays the same notes in the same order, but in the space after the melody is finished, almost like an echo. And fugue builds part by part and uses unique lines to partially overlap the melody and create a layered texture. And as the melody moves forward onto the next line, we we'll just restate the previous part as it goes along. So it's almost like one step behind. In order to know what harmony or counterpoint to play, it's important to listen well 
and understand the chord changes that are happening in the song. And the tips I'm going to give now I'll demonstrate on the piano, but it's equally possible to do most of these things on any other instrument that you may know how to play. For piano, usually we would learn to form the chords with the right hand while playing just the tonic of the chord or the root note with the left hand. Avoid playing chords, particularly close voiced chords like thirds in the left hand because it starts to sound quite muddy um, quite quickly. And so uh, we, we don't want to do that in a band context, particularly when there's other instruments like a bass guitar or uh, other things like the drums that are going to be filling up this sort of space. We don't want to also add very thick low down chords. For inverted chords, chords shown with no, a letter either side of a slash um, symbol on our chord sheet, the pianist should form the chord on the front side of the line with their right hand and the note following the line with the left hand. So for example, if I was going to play a G slash B or a G over B, then G is my right hand chord and B is my left hand. And while you could simply pound chords in time to the beat, <laughs> there are other techniques um, that you could use that are going to add a much nicer texture to chordal piano playing. And we'll look at some of those now. Oscillation is one technique. If a chord consists of three notes, for example, one, three, five, to make the chord of C in the scale of C, you do not need to play all three notes at the same time. You know, you don't have to play to this. You could oscillate between, say, one of the notes and the other two. In this way, you've created movement without having to add any extra notes. There's nothing extra that's having to be thrown in there. Another way to create movement is to arpeggiate the chord. And rather than playing all the notes at the same time, play them one after the other in a repeated pattern. As the chord changes, just add new notes into the pattern, replacing the former notes. And this sounds much smoother than playing a whole chord followed by another whole chord. Um, and so you can even you can even break that up with a scale pattern or something simple, some simple little run that will make it sound more interesting. And you can experiment with adding the second to a chord, or you could experiment by adding the sixth to a chord. Unlike the fourth and seventh, the second and sixth don't really push the music in a different direction. While the G7 chord feels like it's pushing you back to the C. The G6 chord is quite happy staying where it is, <laughs> just like the G2 chord. It doesn't feel like it's pushing it anywhere. So we can add some of these notes to add a bit of flavor, extra flavor to our chords. In order to go beyond basic chordal playing, you'll need to experiment with counterpoint. Here, there is no substitute for experience. The more you play, the more you will understand which little runs and notes are going to work for you and which ones you should avoid using. But the important thing to remember is that most of improvisation is simply chords, scales, and arpeggios. So, if you can master those, you are well on your way to being a really useful church musician. Mm -hmm.